from Wingate University and WUTV. This is Wingate Today. Hello and welcome to Wingate Today. I'm Jeff Atkinson. Fresh off a lively and captivating campaign season, Wingate University made some political news of its own, launching a new undergraduate major, the university's 35th major, political science. It's our top story. I've heard people say this. He was the only political scientist on campus when he arrived three years ago, Dr. Joseph Ellis, faculty member. But since then, what's happened in this department has been nothing short of amazing. We started with none. We started with none. Many universities offer a major in political science, but Wingate University hasn't had one up till now. Ellis started teaching poli-sci, and students started enrolling. Two became four, four became six, six became eight, and three years later, we were able to put together the enough momentum to get a major. It helped that this past election cycle was one of the most lively in recent memory. From the White House on down, interest in politics is at an all-time high. Momentum or steam and Ellis became a sought-after media expert, even working the Democratic National Convention in Charlotte. In three years, he figures he's been interviewed 40 to 50 times. Further, the university drew attention this fall when it hosted the one and only debate between U.S. House of Representative candidates Larry Kissel and Richard Hudson, running in North Carolina's 8th Congressional District. Ellis and colleague Dr. Magdalena Krajewska have been passionate advocates for turning political science into a major. Students could minor in it, but now they can get a degree in the field. We need young people to be active citizens. Uh, we need young people to have the knowledge of how they can influence politics you know, at the local level, at the national level, how international politics affects what's going on in their lives. And that excites students like Blake Izell, who are now considering adding poli-sci to their studies. I'm considering a double major in uh, criminal justice and political science. So that will, hopefully one will translate into the other and make me better at better at the other. I definitely want to be a sports broadcaster, but if something like that didn't work out, it would definitely be able to help me work for a different news company and cover more stories than it would just be with just a normal communications major. Beginning in August 2013, students will be able to declare a major in political science. I think in terms of just em employment opportunities, if you want to be a lawyer, if you want to be an educator, like in, in my situation, if you want to be, go into public service, if you want to go into the military, it's just a really versatile, good major to have. Some colleges and universities are using their political science departments in a way to bring media attention to their institutions. Poli-sci departments have started conducting public opinion polls, which have led to widespread press coverage of the college or university. Wingate University honored its biggest single benefactor, Porter B. Byram, unveiling a bust of the Charlotte lawyer, businessman, and philanthropist. A ceremony was held inside the School of Business that bears his name, with Byram, who's 92, in attendance. This is the sixth bust the university has commissioned. Byram's gift of nearly $21 million established an endowed scholarship, among other things, that's made an indelible mark on the university. There has never been a single more important philanthropist to any university in North Carolina than Porter Byram to Wingate University. Mr. Byram, you have changed everything here. You have made everything here better. Afterwards, Byram had lunch with some 60 freshmen attending Wingate, made possible by his generous gift. They're the inaugural class of Byram scholars. The United States is falling behind other nations when it comes to math and science. A 2009 study found that American students ranked 25th among 34 countries in math and science behind nations like China, Singapore, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Finland. It's why there's been so much emphasis in STEM learning, getting students to embrace careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. We're here to tell you a little bit about STEM careers and different opportunities that you have as you progress in your educational career. It's a Wednesday morning. Students in Wingate University School of Pharmacy, second year students, aren't in their own class, but teaching in an eighth grade class. This is why I want you to open your vials. They're at Marvin Ridge Middle School in Waxhaw in the Exploring Career Decisions class, telling and showing these 13 and 14 year olds what it's like to be a pharmacist. Who has ever seen one of these? Okay, can you tell me what it's used for? Showing them how a pharmacist compounds drugs and fills out a prescription label. Planting the seed, getting them to think now about a career in medicine. 
we decided on middle school students because they're able to actually start thinking about the electives that went, that they would like to choose in high school and so we felt that that would be the best uh, the best age important work if the U.S. hopes to turn back the clock of falling behind in math, science, and technology, says Dr. Carolyn Ford, professor and assistant dean of academic services in the School of Pharmacy. We are way at the bottom. We are no longer leading the nations in the world on science uh, and technology. For the future pharmacists, it's part of a community outreach program the School of Pharmacy does to get students to see that education is not just limited to the classroom. They need to be out in the community. Students, the eighth graders, appreciate hearing from someone closer to their own age. You get to learn a lot about different careers and it's just kind of interesting because it opens your eyes up to new work, new career clusters. Did they change any minds about pursuing something in medicine? Their teacher is not doubting. They're going to be the business people and they're going to be the medical doctors and they're going to be um, the pharmacists um, and they're, they're going to be the once they're going to be taking care of us <laughs> when we retire. <laughs> the STEM program, Science, Technology, Math, a School of Pharmacy is doing, has become so popular, organizers say they're in the process of applying for a grant, the Connect a Million Minds grant, to help fund the community outreach program after the course is over. It's not the only way Wingate students are reaching out. Student athletes went into the classrooms at East Union Middle School. Here they are pictured with a principal and shared with the teens and preteens about the importance of academics, setting goals, and respecting others. They told about the obstacles they've had to overcome in hopes that they can encourage others. Their appearance at East Union Middle, a role model program the school is calling SOAR. Next up, a new segment we're introducing here on Wingate today. We're calling Overtime. We're going to be highlighting people in our community who go the extra mile in their work and in life, who go overtime and are driven to succeed. Kim Williams in the Marketing and Communications Office at Wingate is our reporter for Overtime. Hey, Kim, who are you spotlighting this month? When I heard Jeff Guller's story, I knew it was literally a powerful story. At the age of 71, when others his age might be slowing down, He's not only teaching students here at Wingate, he's competing in weightlifting competitions and setting world records in powerlifting. Jeff began his powerlifting a little over a year ago while recuperating from hip replacement surgery in an effort to lose weight. After the first meet, he got hooked. He also found that there were no other world records in his categories. So far, he has competed in four competitions and holds world records. There are not a lot of crazy old men like me who participate in the sport. He currently holds records for the bench press, the deadlift, and for the squat. This month he hopes to break his records at a competition in Hickory. He and his fan club wear t-shirts that read powerlifting club with the Hebrew symbol meaning strength. I find that at my age it's more important than it ever was to do resistance training. Once a month Jeff trains in Columbia with Donnie Thompson who's known as the strongest man on the planet to learn technique. Thompson's combined total in powerlifting exceeds 3,000 pounds. Jeff also trains at a gym in Gastonia where he lives. Most of the young uh, big people train four days a week. Mm -hmm. um, that's a little taxing on my old bones. So I train three days a week pretty religiously. He finds it difficult to convince his peers that they ought to do resistance training. It was more fun 50 years ago but it's more essential now. Exercise is proven to maintain bone structure, keep muscles from atrophying, and ward against Alzheimer's. A former prosecutor and defense attorney with 40 years of experience, Jeff teaches criminal law at Wingate. And he sees a direct correlation between exercise and brain power. He also helps the football team with weight training. I would think you'd be very motivating and inspiring to them too. I don't know. They, uh, they seem to respond well. I holler and scream and say terrible things to them and they do very well. Powerlifting consists of three lifts, the deadlift, the squat, and the bench press. Competitors are grouped in two categories by their age and their weight class. What an amazing man. What an inspiration. Why in the world does he do this? We asked him that and he said, because I can. 71 years old. And he's teaching here at the university? Yes. He's a retired defense attorney, prosecutor, and now he teaches criminal law in the sociology department. Kim Williams, thank you very much.
On the subject of athletes, Wingate University is adding another sport to its roster, indoor track and field. They'll be competing this winter in meets at Winston-Salem State in January and at Clemson University in February, both schools with impressive facilities. Coaches say with the addition of indoor track and field, it gives student athletes an opportunity to compete during the winter months, helping them prepare for the outdoor season, which starts in the spring. This marks the 22nd NCAA Division II sport the university has. There's a new men's lacrosse coach, Michael Lawson, named to the job in December. He comes here from Mount Olive College, where he started a lacrosse program, successfully recruiting athletes from all over the world. Starting in 2013-2014, the South Atlantic Conference adds men's lacrosse, one of four new sports the league is adding. After tallying the points from all the fall sports, the Wingate Bulldogs are at the top of the leaderboard in the conference's prestigious Eccles Athletic Excellence Award. From the fall sports, one Wingate team finished first, volleyball. Four teams had second place finishes in the conference, and one team had a fourth place finish. It's the most points the Bulldogs ever had at this point in the year in the chase for the Eccles Award. Wingate, as you know, has won it six years in a row. Joining us now is the voice of Bulldog Sports, Ryan Brown, and we're talking about another list Wingate's at the top of. That's right, Jeff. It's been well documented on this show and across campus on how successful Wingate student athletes have been on the field or court. But just as impressively, Bulldog athletes have put the student and student athlete better than anyone in the state and conference. Excellence Cups, SAC titles, region championships, and NCAA meet runners, all part of the impressive success Wingate Athletics has achieved over the past few years. But just as impressive has been the academic success of Bulldog student athletes on the national level. The Academic All-America program was founded by Lester Jordan from Southern Methodist University in the 1950s. This is Wingate Sports Information Director David Sherwood, who has been nominating students for Academic All-America for the past 25 years, and he knows the importance of these accolades. We believe the Academic All-America program is a great way to celebrate both athletic and academic achievement. Wingate has the most Academic All-America nominees among colleges and universities in the state of North Carolina since 2000, more than Duke University and more than the University of North Carolina. Who was the first Wingate Academic All-America Award winner? Current women's basketball coach Ann Hancock who turned something she didn't even know about into one of her most prized possessions. Being an All-America selection on the court was really special to me, but probably more rewarding was being a COSADA academic All-America selection. It was something that I didn't even really know existed, but through David Sherwood's hard work, he got me the award. So that was uh, really neat for me. On the conference level, Wingate has a dominant lead with 59 all-time SAC Scholar Athlete Awards. 17 more than second place Tusculum. One of those SAC Scholar athletes is science major and tennis player Kelly Ferguson, who balances winning championships with excelling in the classroom. Winning Scholar athlete uh, was so important to me. As a chemistry major, I know what it takes. I put in a lot of hours of studying, just as many hours as, as I put in in practice. With the university's academic standards raising each year, there are sure to be many future Bulldog athletes picking up more and more accolades. Some of those may come from women's basketball and from a coach that has set the precedent for her players. Now being the head coach at Wingate, having received those awards, I can really encourage the athletes to strive to do the same thing, to have success on the court and in the classroom as well. With fall sports wrapping up, Jeff, another couple chances for Wingate to get another academic All-America and further that lead. Very impressive list. What is to come? What's ahead? Well, January will feature every Wednesday and Saturday basketball doubleheader in the South Atlantic Conference with plenty of swim meets on the weekends. And then once we start February, spring sports will mix in with those winter sports. You guys are going to be busy. Ryan Brown, thank you very much. If you've ever been overseas, you know how important it is to take pictures. Well, Wingate students who've gone on what the university calls Winter National Study Abroad programs got a chance to show off their favorite photos in a contest during International Week in November. Cash prizes were awarded to the best photos. As we go to a break, take a look at some of them now. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Wingate today, and it's time for our alumni spotlight. And for that, we go to contributing reporter Brian Stevenson, an alum of Wingate University. And this time you've got two people in the spotlight. That's exactly right, Jeff. We're talking to Nikki Ferrante Rochelle and Rod Rochelle. Rod graduated in 1998, Nikki in 99. Both were athletes and both are following their athletic careers on into the workplace. Rod is a baseball coach and Nikki is working for ESPN. He had his signature Heisman moment when they beat Alabama. This is part of what you see when watching a show on ESPNU. But Nikki Ferrante Rochelle is one of the many people behind the scenes that helps make it all happen. So there's two boxes up top which has the Heisman trophy in it. The three boxes on the bottom have the headshots of the three finalists. Nikki is a producer at ESPN. She works on the show College Football Daily. Every morning the production team talks about each element of the show. After the meeting she spends her time working on everything from graphics for her segment to making sure all of the stats in the computer are accurate. This is where um, CFB Daily is shot from. In a little bit we'll go down the hallway to Studio 2. There's a touch screen and we'll get that segment um, complete on the Heisman finalists since that was just announced last night. The job has long hours and keeps Nikki on her toes. Sports television is always going on, so there's never really a break. You've just got to learn how to manage things and kind of- Managing things your... includes at home, where Nikki and her husband Rod are having a blast raising their three-year-old son Preston. Both play two sports at Wingate, so it's no surprise that they have sports-related careers. Rod works at Cannon School in Concord. I'm the varsity baseball coach, also the assistant athletic director, um, and I have, has co have coached football also, uh, but with the new addition of Preston to scale back. Things will get even busier in the house next spring when the couple adds a new addition to the family. But Rod loves working with young people and even talking to them about his alma mater. One of my former players, he was the first one to sign off the first varsity team I had, and he played at Wingate for two years. So that was really exciting for me. Even with a busy schedule, Nikki and Rod try to stop by Wingate when they can. You always make a quick stop in the bookstore to see Miss Cindy Jordan all the time. Uh, but it, it's good to see us growing. You know, being in housing, I look at it now with all that they've built and I'm just like, wow. Back at ESPN, after a morning of planning, Nikki is almost ready to tape her segment. Then we'll come to you guys on camera and this will be up here. So you'll just kind of welcome us in, let us know what they're doing touch screen here. After everyone knows the game plan, it's showtime. Stand by, Monica's going to count you in. Stand by. The segment lasts about six minutes as analysts debate the topic of the day, who will win the Heisman. You can see the cameras stay busy catching all of the action, and in the control room the team works hard to make sure everything looks great. No matter how crazy the day is though, coming home to Preston makes it worth it for mom and dad. We have a good time. It's, it's two different types of jobs. They're fun in different ways. They're stressful in different ways. But, you know, we just, we make it work and we enjoy what we're doing. And like he says, when you stop enjoying what you're doing, then it's time to, time to move on. Jeff, they're just a delightful couple. I've known them for a long time. And one little tidbit, we talked about they're having their second child in the spring. They're having a baby boy. And you heard it here first. How about that? Nikki's got to be busy this time of year. She is. A lot of college football is in her uh, daily schedule, and of course she will be traveling with ESPN to some of the Bowl Championship Series games in early January. Brian Stevenson, thank you very much. Here's a question for you. Have you noticed courtesy taking a back seat, that people are more rude, less respectful of each other? Four out of five Americans say the lack of respect and courtesy is a serious national problem. It is a hot topic. And it was the focus of a discussion organized by NPR radio station WFAE in Charlotte, a forum called Public Conversation. Wingate President Jerry McGee was invited to be a panelist, the radio station taking note of an op-ed piece McGee wrote for the Charlotte Observer and other papers, challenging the campaigns of Pat McCrory and Walter Dalton, the two running for governor, to avoid the mud and keep the race civil. Mother Teresa, when she was in Charlotte a few years ago, she said, uh, if you're really, really, really concerned about world peace, go home and love your family. Well, if you're really, really concerned about this lack of respect, go home with a commitment that my family 
is going to do this well. We're going to respect one another. We're going to respect our neighbors. We're going to respect everyone else. And that's how it begins. That's how most movements begin. WFAE's public conversation on respect was recorded in November and WUTV cameras were there. We plan to broadcast the program on Channel 22 at a later date. Check our website, wingate.edu slash go slash WUTV to find the times it will air. Joining us now is Ben Richardson, Wingate University's website and new media marketing coordinator who follows all the trends in social media and what's going on in the world of high tech. And there is a lot going on. It's a segment we're calling Blog Talk. What's up this time, Ben? Well, Jeff, Wingate University continues to build onto its social media platform. The athletic and marketing departments are rolling out new campaigns. In athletics, we've decided to brand ourselves as champions in life. While this certainly encompasses the success of our student athletes, we're going to be using a message throughout the community designed to promote the Bulldog spirit. On Twitter, we're going to be using the hashtag Believe in the Bulldog. This will be displayed on a banner at athletic events to encourage students to tweet about the events they're attending. A great way to add to our online community. On a different note, most people are well aware of the iPhone droid battle. With Apple's recent release of the iPhone 5 and Samsung's release of the Galaxy 3, we've decided to start a survey of our own. So here's the drill. Go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash WingateUniv, or our Twitter page, at WingateUniv, and let us know which phone you think is best. Again, we're talking about the iPhone 5 and the Galaxy 3. We would love to hear from you. And Jeff, that's Blog Talk for this month. Ben Richardson, thank you very much. Capturing the images of the holidays, Wingate University professor and chair of the art department, Dr. Louise Napier, has been doing that for 14 years, and her latest thing of beauty is out now. The original watercolor captures one of the university's newest buildings, the Levine College of Health Sciences, and it's been fashioned into a holiday card that's being sent to family and friends this season. Speaking of the season, if you've lived around here for any length of time, you know what happens to one tiny mill town in our area. During the month of December, it takes on a new name. McCaddenville becomes Christmas Town, USA. And in this month's issue of Our State, the magazine about North Carolina, there's an article about that transformation. And it's written by Ryan McGee, senior writer for ESPN Magazine and ESPN.com. And he joins us live on Wingate today. Welcome. Thank you. How did you get involved in this article? How did this come about? Uh, my father, who works here at Wingate. Uh, when I was a child, worked at Gardner Webb. Uh, and it was a quick jump over for us from Boiling Springs and Shelby over to Christmastown, USA. I didn't know it was called McCaddenville. I thought it was Christmastown, <laughs> USA. And so we used to go probably from the ages of five all the way through 10 when we lived in that area. And so, you know, fast forward 30 years and Our State Magazine, I've, I've been forcing to do a, a few stories for them over the years. And I had expressed my love for McCaddenville, you know, to somebody over there at some point. And so Elizabeth Hudson, who's the great editor-in-chief there at our state, has done fantastic stuff over there the last couple of years. Elizabeth just shot me an email and said, I think we want to do the Christmas Town story. And I actually reported it a year ago in 2011, but the story uh, didn't write it till the summer, and of course it's published now. That's what I was going to ask you. You had to, the, the magazine came out before they threw the switch right. on McCadden. Yeah, no, it was, and it's interesting because with ESPN, you know, that 24-hour news cycle, I feel like I'm just filing stories all the time, and it's something that just happened or something that's about to happen, and it just never stops. Well, with this, you got a year to work on it. I was like, are you serious? <laughs> I mean, and as a writer, that's just great, but, but it allowed me to went and experienced it, you know, the lighting ceremony and the Yule Log ceremony, which I had never been to. It, you know, I'd been like everyone else. I just drove through and saw the lights and had never gotten to see day one. And, and, and you know, the second day when they have the great Yule Log ceremony, which I won't miss that again. It was fantastic. But then it also allowed me this summer to go in and see the guys as they're untangling the lights, which is you know, the scene that the story starts with, because that's the part that nobody sees is in August. You know, these guys, these volunteers, don't get paid a dime, and they're just untangling lights. I told you before we got started that I have done myself many McCaddenville stories, and I thought, I can't read another McCaddenville story. <laughs> but I did, and you found some unique characters in this thing. Well, the, the key was finding the people that had been there since the beginning. And, you know, we're fortunate that this started in the 1950s. So a lot of the adults in town, and it's, it's a small town. I mean, it's, population-wise, 
it hasn't changed a whole lot. And so what you have is there are a lot of people that live on Main Street and live along the parade route who have been there since day one. And there's some conflicting stories about how exactly it started. And I think they take some pride in that. Everybody's got a different story about it. But at the end of the day, it's, it was the right timing because these people aren't going to be here you know, 10 years from now. So do the story now while the people that were there in the beginning are still around. How did it start? What did you find in the real, the real story? Well, the town is a mill town. Uh, Far Yarns, you know, which is still, the main offices are still there right you know, on the other side of I-85 from, from the town itself. And Mr. and Mrs. Farr were just really into Christmas. And so when the townspeople started to do their own decorations, and some say it started on the hill over the volunteer fire department. Some say it started in front of the Methodist church. Some say it started in front of the offices at Far Yarns. <laughs> but when Mr. Farr saw what was happening, he basically went to the town and said, all right, he went to the guys that kind of started doing these initial decorations and saying, whatever you do, however big it gets, I'll pay for it. Well, that's all those guys needed to hear. Next thing you know, they're welding and cutting pipes and they're cutting a big Merry Christmas sign for the side of the hill. But, but it started with that. And, and to this day, Far Yarn still underwrites the power bill that can be attributed to the lights. And so even as mill villages aren't what they were in the 1950s, there's still a relationship there between the company and the town that was built around it that you don't see very much anymore anywhere in America. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this important question. How do you get in the back door? How do you, how do you <laughs> miss all those line, lines well, of cars? Well, you can't. And, and, you know, I have tried. The, the main entrance everyone takes is off of I-85. But then there's also kind of a sneaky back way, the way that most people exit, you know, off of Wilkeson Boulevard slash 74. Well, I've tried to go in that way, and it just it doesn't matter. The, the, the key is, I've found in my experience, and they say, the key is do it early in the month. The closer it gets to Christmas, the more crowded it gets. And also kind of try to get there by sundown. You know, if you're in position, I take my family, we have dinner in Gastonia, mm -hmm. early dinner in Gastonia, and then sneak over there right about the time the sun goes down. Because if you sneak in then, that's how you can avoid it. But I also say this, roll the windows down and just enjoy the traffic. Because if you roll the windows down and you listen, that's how you really experience it. And, and what people in McCabin will say is, get out of the car. They say, park, get out of the car and walk, because the view is completely different and the experience is completely different. And I haven't done that yet. This year I'm going to do it. All right. Ryan McGee, it was a pleasure to see you. Good to, good to see you. And um, I don't know. Last name, tell us who your dad is. Yeah, dad yeah. is uh, Dr. McGee and uh, just celebrated, what, his 20th anniversary, 20th anniversary. as anniversary. President Wingett. And we're going to get a couple more years out of him, so yeah, I'll be around. All right. Brian McGee, thank you very much. Thank you. As we close out this episode of Wingate Today, we want to go back to Christmastown, USA, and leave you with some of the sights and sounds of the season. Our thanks to Our State Magazine for providing these beautiful pictures of the 700,000 lights in McCaddenville, Gaston County. That's our show for this time. I'm Jeff Atkinson. Thanks for watching. Comments? Questions? Contact us. Wingate Today is a production of WUTV and Wingate University's Department of Marketing and Communications.